Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Afambo Patrick Okibo. I'm one of the directors of Center for Memories. And on behalf of the board of trustees and the directors, staff and volunteers of Center for Memories, I welcome you to this March edition, March 2019 edition of Nkata Umwibe. Center for Memories is an initiative that aims to be a repository or a hub for Igbo culture, Igbo history, and most of the activities that we support are all around promoting Igbo culture, Igbo heritage, Igbo history, Igbo traditions. Some of the initiatives we have at the center include this one I bear for today, Nkata Umuibe, which is our monthly uh, distinguished speaker series that we hope to use to bring intellectual discourse around critical issues now confronting as Ndibo. We have other initiatives. We have Nzuko Omwaka, which holds every month as well. And that is focused on, you know, little children. And the idea is to use these events to promote culture and teach them who we are and how we got here and some of the issues we have to confront as a people. We also have a monthly book club, which interestingly is holding tomorrow. And it's for younger people, it's for the youth to get together, discuss books written by Igbo authors, um, and an opportunity for you to make friends mingle and you know, get to widen your network. So we encourage you to take advantage of some of these initiatives. We're also very grateful to Fidelity Bank for donating a library at the center. And it's a children's library, um, which we hope would create a place where we whet their appetite, we encourage their curiosity. We're really excited about the speaker we have today. I will not introduce him, rather, I will invite the chairman of Enugu Sports Club, who is our gracious host, Chief Ben Etiaba, to give his welcome and opening remarks. Chief Etiaba, a round of applause for him. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the Cinema Auditorium of Enugu Sports Club. Welcome to the March 2019 edition of Nkata Omuibe. And as you know, and we one night working, we are going to Half a year Ike Chioke. But I want to more accordingly introduce you. I I recall a few months ago the discussion that led to bringing Nkata Omwebe to Enugu Sports Club. And I'm delighted that as this is the very last edition of this distinguished speaker series that I'll preside over as the chairman of Enugu Sports Club, I am delighted that we have a super guest speaker. Ike is not new to Enugu Sports Club. As a kid, he was a ball boy here at the tennis section. He played tennis. He lived in Enugu before he moved on, moved on to bigger and better things. So I'm actually delighted to welcome him in particular to this hall this evening. As I am delighted 
to welcome everyone else here this evening. Please permit me not to name the special invitees individually, but just know that we are happy to host you. And as I say goodbye from here, I want to assure you that I will be here every month in the audience <laughs> to, to listen to the distinguished speakers who will be here to speak to us. Enjoy the evening. Be a part of the club. As I say, thank you to Patrick Okibo. Thank you to Nana Anyimude. And of course, our own professor and Professor Okafo for being at the forefront of this great series. At the Sports Club, 1929, Dalono Omonem. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Ben Etiaba, whose visionary leadership of Enugu Sports Club will be will be discussed for years to come. I remember when we began to mute this idea of having a distinguished speaker series here in Enugu every month. Interestingly, the first person I discussed the idea with was Chike, Chief Chike Mwadweke Abalanze, who is the chairman of uh, uh, a radio station, Urban Radio, here in Enugu. And the radio station happens to be one of the sponsors of this event, or they support this event. And when I spoke to him about it, he agreed that the best place to cite this series will be in Enugu Sports Club. Mainly because of the visionary leadership of Chief Ben Etiaba. We tried that night. We tried to reach him on the phone, we couldn't. But as Providence will have it, we ran into each other a few weeks, maybe a week or two later, um, someplace in Abuja. And as soon as I saw him, I grabbed him and uh, extracted a commitment from him. And for close to a year, he has provided great support. We will miss his leadership but we know that as a true leader, he has put in place uh, the right institution to continue to support not just this program, but all the other great initiatives that you've championed. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nana Ude is the convener of Nkata Umwibe, and it's my honor and privilege to invite him to introduce our distinguished speaker, I choke. A round of applause for Nana. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, like uh, Patrick said, this is one of the initiatives of the Center for Memories. And the idea behind this is for us to have a platform where we can have deliberations around Igbo issues, pick out a theme for a month, identify a distinguished speaker for that theme, invite him to this platform, he speaks to it, and then thereafter we have an interactive session. And we hope, and it's been happening, that during the course of the month, the discussions around this theme generated from this platform has continued to drive conversations on Igbo platforms, whether digital platforms or physical platforms where people meet and discuss. So it's been a pleasure to have uh, Chief Etia, but we can't con to say thank you enough. We'll continue to say thank you to you. You gave us a home for Nkatu Mwibe, and we are so proud of the work you have done here. So, in May, we started this series, and we invited Professor Chede Odenkalo. He spoke on Igbo Ekunye lessons from post-war recovery in Southeast Nigeria. From May till date, we've had a couple of speakers speak around different themes. Last month, we had Tinejen Baozuku, who spoke on the digital economy. We've had a speaker 
from Delta State who spoke on identity. We had two female speakers, Cheik Odua and Yvonne Banefo. Yvonne spoke on Gidigidi Bugweze, while Cheka spoke on Nkiruoka Azubuike. We also had DK Chukumerije in August, and DK, as usual, was electrifying. He spoke on Jidor for politics of ideology and conscience. We've had Professor Okin Dibe all the way from America. He came in June, and he spoke on Echi Dime, Ndibo, and the parable of the snail. The month after that, we had Dr. Okeike Chuku, and he spoke on Ejin Duemegene, Foundations for an Igbo Rebirth. So it's been an interesting time here since May with the discussions we've had here. And so it's exciting that this month we have someone here who can easily be described as the man with the magic touch. I like to tell people that give Ike a hundred naira, he'll turn it into a million naira. He can easily pass as he, the number one investment banker in Alibo. He's had a 25 years experience in the industry, and his specialization span across telecom, media, financial services, and general industrial sectors. He's had work experience at Anderson, Goldman Sachs, Salmon, Smith, Barney Incorporated. But interestingly, he has a first degree in civil engineering, and he's been... Then thereafter, he went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and got an MPhil in management studies. He's currently the group managing director of Afri Invest. And here today, it's our pleasure and my privilege to finally get to welcome to this space, Ike Chioke. And he's going to speak today on, he's going to speak today. I want somebody to say that. Mbo Reinventing Enterprise Nalibo. Thank you so much, Ike. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm here tonight to speak on the topic of Umburu Onyekoro. Um, I think the literal translation will be you reap what you sow. But one could also translate it as to say the seed that you sow, if you go the exact translation. And the idea came from Patrick after he called me up a couple of weeks ago. I was in Europe and you know, insisted I come to uh, exercise my civic responsibility as an Igbo man and speak uh, at this forum. So it's my privilege and honor to be here with you. And the sub-theme is reinventing enterprise in Alibo. Because I'm I as in the Afia. So when I talk about enterprise, I mean literally trading, reinventing enterprise, the opportunity for enterprise. Ebidom now by just describing what we consider as Anibo, which is Southeast Nigeria, and taking it just from a literal geographic translation. Because obviously, Ndib will spread out to Delta State and down to River State and even Cross River and around. But if you say Igbo in Nigeria, people will think of the Southeast. Uh, this definition does not include Ndib being a, a, a Buja, more Kanu, more Lagos. Talk less of Ndib will be abroad in diaspora. But in Nigeria, Ndib will be in Southeast Nigeria. Our population today is 22 million. Our GDP, it comes out to 9.7 trillion naira. It has 27 billion dollars. Based on 2018 data, out of that 22 million population, 40% be youth. And youth will mean in the Dika from 30 years and under. It was called our GDP divided by population of Puta. 416,000 naira per annum per person. So, in a way, the statistics are not all the qualified because you can do something with it. In a way, Anibo, from a political context, I were five states in Southeast Nigeria out of 36, so representing almost 
in terms of the states. I went 95 local governments out of 774 in the whole country, which works out to 12%. In terms of voting population, based on the statistics in the INEC for this election, I went 8.3 million voters out of 84 million voters, so roughly about 9% of the total voting population. Kita election, the MSC election, in the election map, Anyaifuna, uh, the red bull map on the a PDP, green bull map on the APC. But in the Bonine, the whole of Igbo land voted for PDP in terms of majority. So, obviously, oh, it occurred was something. And I like Indian MA business. So we clearly went for the party that will support business. But our total vote of 1.6 million is actually down about 1 million compared to the election of 2015, where we, we gave PDB something like 2.6 million votes. So obviously, there has been a lot of, uh, I would say, rearrangement of votes by INEC from this exercise, since there were more voters registered this time around than there was in 2015. But we're still uh, short by 1 million compared to what we did the last time. Somebody waking in there for anya when you say, okay, kita ije tiye tell in the PDP. I can I can name me buanya again in the new administration. It is the me buanya before, and that's one of the recurring themes I find sometimes when I speak to in the banya about oh abu monyibo. So the center will not give me my fair share. That we've been oppressed. We are oppressed by Nigeria, and really my, the main meat of my presentation is to say stop. Stop feeling oppressed. There's enough that we have that we can actually ignore Nigeria and move forward, and move ourselves forward. <laughs> this slide now, now this uh, the total GDP of Southeast Nigeria, put our 9.7 trillion naira as of 2018 data. In the composition, and you have commerce and industry, you can do more small, small businesses around, but are 900 billion, 9%. Then MS services, and that banks, uh, telecoms, represent $7.1 billion, which is 73% of the total. Agriculture, 12%. Oil, I went to the oil, Nakukimo State, and the 6%. But in the total budget of all the five states, Nanibo, for 2019, it's only 870 billion naira out of a total of 9.7 trillion. So, in the natural, when we water, they put out from university, see, they just all in our government. Government represents nine percent of the economy of the southeast. You have ignored the remaining 91 percent because in natural, that is really the meat of this. That. Within Igbo land, we are naturally enterprising people. So that everybody, no matter what you studied, you should be thinking of what business can I set up. If I can't set up, you think of who your, who, which friend of yours has started a business, how can I support him and grow it bigger so we can all make more, rather than waiting to look for a job with government. Amen at this slide, but I them work with that bit and at more services. $7.1 billion, which is 73% of the total economy of Southeast. It can work one year again. If you need me about, if you need telecoms, it's about 10% are representing here, 700 billion naira. Education, 900 billion naira, 13%. Others, about 1 trillion, representing 15%. Financial services, banks and others, 1.2 trillion. But trade, in the Nazoafia is 44%, a total of 2.9 trillion naira. That's 44% of the economy. So, and if you put that 44% of services against the total economy of the Southeast, it's really one third. So, like I said, if you put that university, seek a child on a government, you're looking at 9% opportunity. If you put that university, seek a your own trading business, you can potentially fall into the 33%, one third of the opportunity that's facing everybody in the southeast the question is how you do your own in Mogrebo, after the civil war we had this apprentice model because after the war there are a lot of young men and also women left stranded so that was what really began to propel 
nwa boy anoga structure so what back ring we keep ta asia ke koje gbalo somebody boy na obono cosmetic on ele mo spare parts mo building materials we ko lo all over for 3 or 4 years alo cho lo mo to lo lo mo to lo aka from there oje bi don ke this is an age old model which we have had and but that one boy na agbo na bo dibo even though no general school formally but the one am ta over the 3 or 4 year period on am ta to he na about business ideas where to locate his business how to put the price of his business the products on him or service on him who to supply who to buy goods from yeah who to sell the goods to in terms of customers who are the other business relationships and contacts he needs to have then ogbacha this odibo edo yun no enye ego nke oje bida his own shop okwa from there his own business would expand and after that he becomes his own man and that structure has created time and time again young entrepreneurs out of ibo land which we are known for and the structure has become regenerative over the generation so this is oga well all one by all 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 for 3 to 5 years himself one day becomes an oga he will then find somebody to work for him after that oduko nya ho no the thing and now manufacture other entrepreneurs this is something that we have we have as a culture as a people that is totally different from other ethnic groups in nigeria only igbo people have it and each choice water how to improve yourself you really need to look inside and say strength comes from the things i have as an advantage versus other people sort of us saying oh i am water oil or uh, we are not in government in abuja or we don't have seaports like in the yoruba and lagos let's look at what we have and if you look at what you have you can see there's a lot of opportunity this my boy structure has created many markets in the enko nay the turnover there is over a billion dollars just people selling all kind of items per annum about the market turnover is over 500 million dollars per annum if you count all the different shops and traders and the little commissions they are making area area market over 3 billion dollars annual turnover this is real e commerce happening in front of us that we take for granted alaba further afield outside of southeast you see um alaba 3 billion dollars urban la electronics and all kind of parts there computer village in lagos and la computers and phones and all of that 2 billion dollars turnover and these are statistics in the ochabia g1 na copy name so i and another other thing from balogo market in lagos over 3 billion dollars of turnover so when you put it all together what the Igbo land has that is different from other ethnic groups in nigeria is that we actually have an inbuilt venture capital structure we have an inbuilt venture capital kita ndio yibo ije have a business school or ije stanford i seek no venture capital abo ni nwe izugba idea enye ga ego the person enye ga ego is also giving money to 100 other people statistically expect that maybe 80 of you will fail but 20 10 or 20 will survive and suddenly make a million times more money than all the money gave to other people and that is the same structure that feeds the commerce of ibo land because if i think of today omar can in an our boy in different shops whether it's chemist or spare parts you know drugs cosmetics around ibo land you probably have easily 100,000 young men statistically they don't have any known or this year probably in two years 50 percent will fail in five years you probably not have more than 20 percent of them but i tell you in five years that 20 percent will have more money than about probably 100 times more money than the cumulative amount they do have any no no that is venture capital but then how do we move that forward today's world how do we scale what has become what was seen as an informal structure uh, you know how do we scale it up in modern society that we have today and that is the challenge in trying to reinvent the enterprise you then think of let's see how we can disaggregate it and if you look at the structure the fundamentals of the enterprise you see now that 
and what boy relationship is that there's education and there's information and then there's capital. Again, I repeat, there's education, there's information, and then there's capital formed out of it. If you really look at the educational component of that apprentice model, one boy is actually getting a practical business education from the moment he moves into his, uh, his servitude because he understands business ideas, he understands business location, he understands price setting, he knows supplier selection, he knows customer management, he has business contacts, and then don't you know, he begins his own business expansion. You see? But even though they're daily and apropos, that's exactly what he's learning. On the other hand, a typical young man or woman will go to primary school, go to secondary school, my father get Japu the nurse reserve, Japu University, Tiyoko Masters, Pota. On one hand, my boy graduates as a business owner. When he graduates, he actually has his own business. On the other hand, when we graduate out of former universities, we come out to seek employment. Now, how then can you marry an educated graduate and make him to think like an entrepreneur? And that is the challenge of our model. If you consider that we live in an information age, where knowledge and technology is really the competitive advantage. And data is the new oil. And data is all around us. In fact, today, as you are in this room, we are all products because statistically we are in this room and someone who has a device can probably monitor all the mobile signals emanating from all the mobile phones. And if we are registered on social networks, that is information that somebody else can use. So data is actually the new opportunity that everybody needs to think about how we used to push ourselves forward. Imagine, for instance, that now we're at the market now, that I could have a system to collect all the information from all the guys and all the my boys now all the kita. Suddenly, I will have massive information to show pricing arbitrage between different shops in, the, in that market. It will be there on the computer, but it's not available easily to you and I. That is why Ija Fiakita, Sinin Aki Gofan, Abu Fan Aneku, one small boy, Wake Ba, Osa Fiakita, Osigi, Oga, Chelo, Go Yogi Cook, Sigi Koja, Wotega, the fan. And you've looked around for one hour looking for the fan, you have not found. But he has information. He quickly goes to somewhere that Anna Elena in warehouse, but take a brand new one which you didn't even know there was around, you'll be happy. You pay him, and he moves on. It is that information that has allowed him to make a profit. He may not even have a shop. He may not even have the opportunity of being my boy to anybody. It's just that he's happened to be in that market and saw you coming. But all of us now with technology can leverage on that opportunity, which is really what reinvention can do. Think about it. If you're a young graduate and just come out of university, in the old traditional sense, if you graduated, you have to have a business idea. You then have to find a, a, a shop, a location, for rent. Then you have to figure out how to sell what you're selling, who to supply you whatever it is, customers, business contacts, financing, expansion, before you see profit. But today, you can cut through all that and go straight. All that thing that my boy learned over three to five years, if you understand data and technology, you can graduate. In fact, while you're still in school, you can start. Before you, graduate, you come out, you're ready and you're running. You go from business ideas straight to customers, straight to profit. Because the customers are already in front of you. And there are already many platforms that aggregate your data. And that data is the customer base. Let me give you an example of young entrepreneurs who are leveraging technology today. Um, Kingsley Ayogo is from Enugu Ezeke. I met him on Instagram in 2017. He is a visual artist, and he does the kind of art, and about hyper-realistic art. Let me just quickly turn over. The picture on the left-hand side is a self-portrait he did which popped up on my phone when I was in a museum in Los Angeles and I was looking at a similar artwork. Again, the algorithms of data has already determined that I'm from Enugu State. 
because I have many contacts and I go to Enugu all the time. And I'm looking at art and I'm looking at hyper-realistic art. And while in LA, I got an image of this picture, which I like very much. I, and I started chatting to him. I told him I'd like to buy it. By the time I came back later that year, we got to know each other. And he was staying in an abandoned building, not very far from Eba, Eba Anna Tunnel. Just as you're going down Garden Avenue. That was where he was staying. I thought he was an illegal occupant because it, didn't, it looked very strange. But inside the abandoned building, I carved out one room and made a studio where he stays and paints all day and all night. But he had what? He had a mobile phone and he had an Instagram account. And I noticed that this is particular painting was over 40,000 people had viewed it. By the time I came home to Nigeria, he had actually sold it. Today, he earns about $1,000 per painting. He makes easily 5 million naira a year. He has moved from Enugu to Lagos, although he comes to Enugu to exhibit. And the picture of the Camry uh, added in this slide is the car he bought yesterday. <laughs> he bought it yesterday. And this is a young man only, whose only product idea is the talent that God gave him. I can draw. I can paint. You know? Richard Ogo is a fitness instructor. He's from Isuzu in Enugu State. He has only Wayak. He was orphaned and then he said, since I don't have money to go to school, what is it can I do? He did some jobs as um, a waiter. He was a cleaner in an internet uh, shop, business center. But got interested in fitness and began to follow it on social media and on magazines. And then when he discovered that he could use Facebook and Instagram and the opportunity of those, he began to post his own workouts. He exercised and how he exercised, he posted on social media. From there, he would get contacts who people would tell him, oh yeah, come and train me in my house. And this young man who only has Wayek earns about 300,000 Naira a month. That's going from business idea, the customers are in the data you're using. Instead of using your, your phone to be sharing gossip, you can actually use that phone for business. If you take out Richard's phone, he will kill you because that is his business too, you know? That is him working out. And he, he works out in the gym I belong to in Lagos, and he, he has a lot of important customers, including David Doe, one of the major music stars. That's a young man that didn't go to university. Chiamaka Obuakwe, 26 years old. She has a bachelor's degree. She had worked in different jobs, Jumia, some other IT job, but she just didn't like having a formal job because on Ogide, she's restless, they will suck her, she'll be depressed. But one thing she knew she liked, she liked traveling. She then said, why don't I organize a, you know, tourism business? And she organized trips, post the trips on Instagram, and invite people to pay. And if you check the organization, like she has a trip now to Oida in Benin Republic. It's a very nice resort called Casa de Papa. It's 150,000 naira per head. You have a three-day weekend and stay by the beach in very beautiful location. It's 150,000 naira per head. If you try to do it yourself, you easily spend 250,000. But she has already figured out all the logistics that if you pay her, just show up with your passport and you have a pleasant holiday. So that's what she does. And she makes easily five, six million a year because by the time she aggregates 30 people, she may pay them only half of what she's collected. The rest is for her and her staff, and she keeps on going. So that's the opportunity of leveraging on data, which is the information that is all around us today. Because as we use our phones and go on social networks, we are actually the product. Because when we are looking at something on Facebook, Facebook then knows that, ah, this eyeball is looking at this, and it's advertising revenue because they can go and charge somebody else and say, come and put something on Facebook because Mr. Choke is looking at it along with everybody in this hall. How can we turn that around and use that for our own creative business? And each of these three people, one of the things they have learned and valued is that the same way they can get across to their customers instantly on social media, the same way the customers can also get back to them if something happens. So they began to 
imbibe the character and values of our parents of old, that discipline, that honesty, to be able to promise. What you promise is actually what you get. Because if there is a mistake, it reverberates very quickly. And you, you complain on Instagram and everybody knows about it. And I ask myself, you know, while they are all still individual entrepreneurs, there's opportunity for them to scale up because and get associations of other young men and women and become virtual conglomerates online. And it's there. They just have to maintain that discipline. And if you think about it, why can't Anibo become a place where we are known for honesty and integrity? Interestingly, in my business, I, I run an investment bank. And you would think that to move transactions, you know, like if I wanted to pay you something, you want to be sure that you've collected, you've collected the cash from me before you deliver the goods to me. And that is simple how commerce traditionally works. But interestingly, at a very high level, where I'm dealing with companies that are moving tens of billions of naira, there's not enough time to make sure that that money goes. The actual transaction happens based on integrity. So I'll have a situation where a client will move two billion naira to my account because he trusts Afroinvest. But there has not been any paperwork. All that we have said is on the phone, move the two billion. As soon as I get it, I'm going to move the securities to your own system. So you find that in the mo biggest economies, the same happens in the, on the New York Stock Exchange in London. For big transactions to happen, you actually need a lot of integrity and honesty and transparency for it to work. And that is one opportunity that we can also think of owning as a people. Forget the rest of Nigeria and all the issues that come from you know, voter suppression or the voter cancellation or not even being able to exercise your civic rights. But as a people, we can own that. And you will find that the rest of the country will come to do business with us because they can trust that whatever it is they do is that what they're going to get. So, therein is the story. If you can... If you have information, I can leverage data, it can lead to wealth creation, as these young men have, have ex ex exemplified. Leveraging data can lead to capital. But how can you apply that model to existing businesses? Today, I dare say that every business must have an effective online presence. I still meet a number of CEOs who are proud to say that they are not on WhatsApp, they are not on social media, uh, what is that rubbish? not knowing that they're actually missing a massive opportunity of how to run their business. Every business must be on the, uh, online, must have a, an effective website, must be able to take two or three of the social media platforms and communicate effectively to its customers instantly, real time. Because if there's an opportunity, that's how you touch them. And if there's a problem, you will know instantly and begin to solve it before your people even report to you. And of course, if you're big enough, you should even have a payment portal for your customers to pay you online without you having to wait for them to exchange cash physically with your staff because you then have your, the opportunity of taking the money in advance. Let's look at a typical business like Peace Mass Transit. This is an established business, 40 bus terminals across the country, present in 19 states has 2,000 plus buses, moves about 30,000 passengers daily. And we're all familiar with Peace Mass Transit. It's fairly effective all over the country. How could they potentially reinvent themselves? If you look at 30,000 passengers a day, that is 30,000 eyeballs in a bus. If Peace Mass Transit is keeping an electronic record of all their customers, which is a manifest, the same thing that you do when you board a plane. You actually put your name, your phone number. Sometimes they ask you for an ID, they scan it, it has your date of birth. That already begins to give the business a demographic profile of their customers. From that demographic profile of their customers, they actually have more eyeballs in an, a year than Linda Ikeji, who is making billions because she's doing a blog that has uh, 4 million followers. They have 30,000 daily eyeballs, 210 every month, 10.9 million per annum. And these are people 
that are hostage in a bus for easily four to eight hours. If you have that information, the same company could go and show it to Nigerian breweries or to MTN or the Cadbury's and say, you know, come and put a TV in this bus so you can put your advertising because my people are, they are captive. I can show you from my profile of customers that 10% are above 60, 40% are between 20 to 50, and the rest are children. And then that can begin to tell the advertisers, oh, what can I sell on a bus? What kind of information? The same business can be used as a courier service. You can sell pure water. You can actually package your lunch, some of which they are doing already, um, but with systems, you, you can monitor it so effectively you can take that value chain to a level where the bus business becomes the tail wagging the dog because you make more money from advertising and other services than the actual transport fare that you're charging customers. And that therein lies the opportunity. Now, if you look at this 9.7 trillion naira economy in the southeast, there is a lot inside it. Government is only 9%. Within that services sector, trade and commerce, trade especially, each and every young person, each and every individual ought to be thinking, what can I do? Is it to make necklaces? Is it to make clothes, clothing? I see a number of fashion people, they design clothes, they post it and get clients from there. You know, but as you walk through that process, you can see more opportunities in there. And don't just stop at it. The Southeast economy, as small as it might seem, at $26.9 billion, is actually bigger than the economy of Iceland, which is only $27 billion. Our economy of all of Zambia, $25.8 billion. Or all of Senegal, $24 billion. Bear that in mind. And that tells you the opportunity. Before you then add on the knock-on business that comes from interacting from Mundibu, outside of the region, from Igbo, the people in diaspora and people around Nigeria. Thank you very much. Conversation with him, just to see if we can unpack some of the many issues he raised in this very thought-provoking presentation, and then we will bring it to you. Ike, I was wondering if you could help me unpack further the discussion around younger Igbo people getting out of school, no jobs, you know, millions and millions of unemployed people. Um, I'm sure as they saw the examples you, you put up, and I love the examples because, you know, you didn't, you didn't show like iRoco TV and all of those, you know, where you need you know, multiple millions to do. But in some, in some of their minds, they're still thinking, you know, I need a whole lot of money to start. If you could help share more mm -hmm. on what is it that a young person coming out of school needs to start enterprise, ideas, great, you know, what is it? Thank you. I think, I think what you need is to sort of understand yourself. You need to have a passion for something. It's not just going to school. Um, and some of us, unfortunately, um, don't make many choices for ourselves. Some people are in university studying medicine, but they don't love medicine. They're there perhaps because their parents didn't told them to do it, or engineering, or law. But I think by the time you're coming out as a graduate at the, in the mid-twenties, you must figure out that you have a passion for something, that there are some things you like to do. And that's enough for you to have a business idea. And if you have an idea, you've begun to nurture and develop it. It's easy for a friend, a family friend, a friend or an associate, somebody in your church, somebody in your, your gym to understand and be able to help. Let me put it in another way. Um, I went to my village, you know, several years ago, I was talking to some of the young men in my village and said, okay, how many of you took jam last year? And surprisingly, none of them had taken jam. And when I asked, why didn't you take jam? They said, well, I don't have any chance of getting someone to pay for university, so I did not bother. 
to take jam. That then struck me because I was looking for somebody who had taken jam, who had passed jam, so I could sponsor university. You know, that then led me to start a, a scholarship scheme, an idea, a separate matter. But to make sure, in, in that, what I'm trying to do with that analogy is that if you don't have a passion for something and you have not begun to nurture it, it's difficult for someone to come in and wake up one day and say, take money and start this business, when you have not shown any particular fondness for it, you know. You, you understand? You must think of something you like. Or if you can't think of something you can do, look around you. There's probably somebody doing something you can help to do. Some obscene amount of stores across Nigeria. What does that mean for Igbo businesses? And how can Igbo businesses re not respond, but proactively, uh, proactively hedge against what appears to me to be a significant risk coming down in the next few years? Uh, that's a good point. And you, you have to think that as an Igbo business person who has a shade, a shop in a better market, and then ShopRite comes to Enugu, and say, for instance, you're selling air conditioners, and ShopRite is able to drop your price. Remember, there's a segment of your customers who don't actually like the inconvenience of driving into ShopRite, finding parking, walking in there, and paying that 230,000 naira to buy the AC to go out. Meanwhile, they didn't even like coming to a better market. If you, if you have your data, you can use ShopRite as your new warehouse. You stay in your office and quickly with WhatsApp and be sending to your customers, we have this available, we have this available. The guy will check and ShopRite, you see it's 230,000, but you say you bring it to the house for 235,000. By the time he considers the effort of leaving his office, he might actually say yes. Come on, come on, deliver it to the house. Plus, you can also offer things that soft shop right will not do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will install for fifteen thousand because if you bought your AC, you still have to install. So yes, there are issues with the big uh, retailers coming in, you know. But there's also opportunity. I know a young man who has an interesting business model in Lagos. He looked at all the wholesale businesses and realized that the biggest problem they have is they don't have soft, uh, what I call velocity of money. The margins they are seeking is too much, even as a wholesaler. And they don't understand that this is not it. So he has, he has brought in this American club, which is like a price line, where you're a registered member of the, of the shop. You have to pay 5000 a month to belong. If you pay 5000 a month, you're a member. If you want, each time you show up, you pay 1000 to enter. But it allows you to buy in cartons everything at the official wholesale price of the big manufacturers. And suddenly his business is taking off. He cannot sell enough because all the traders now buy from him. Instead of having to build, buy a big store where they have to pay rent, it's more efficient to have that membership and know that when you come in and say, I need 20 ACs for my new hotel, you can quickly go there and pick up 20 latest ones and move it in there. So that's an interesting model too. And this young man, what does he do? He makes money from your registration, but at the back end, the manufacturers are happy to drop the stuff in his warehouse. In fact, the manufacturers are no longer using their own warehouse because that's costing them money. They have to put lights, put security. They put the stuff directly in his warehouse and people come and buy out of it. So yes, the shop rights of this world can come on, but I think our existing businesses can re-engineer themselves and recognize that the, the game is the velocity of the, tr of the transaction. It is not buying something and storing it for six months. I'd rather, I'm waiting to make 10% margin. I'd rather make 1% and sell it. Everything moves out in one week. If you make 1% a week, in six months time, you've made far much more money. In fact, you make 0.5% a week and turn over, you make far more money. And that's really where the game is going. And this is my last question before I turn it over to the audience. And it's a bit tricky because on this platform, we try to stay away from politics. But if you're in the politics period, it's also very um, tempting you know, to, to ask a question in that realm. So most people in the Southeast are uh, concerned about you know, uh, gaining power at the center and what that means for the region. But some of the numbers you've shown here um, trigger a lot of thoughts that if this is a 9.7 trillion economy, bigger than Iceland, bigger than Senegal, it means that we are in five states, 
sitting on what is bigger than a developed country. Yeah? Um, what are some of the things that we as Igbo people, both people in government and people working in civil society or whatever, what are some of the things we should be thinking of in terms of gaining economic independence for the region? Um, some framework of some sort, just something to trigger uh, further discussion. Thank you. That's a very good question. And you see, our 9.7 trillion naira economy is coming from five uncoordinated states. You know, meanwhile, the same amount in Zambia is a coordinated, reasonably more coordinated country. But you can see five uncoordinated states, even when they're in the same party, they're fighting each other. You know, chairman of the Association of Governors, they will not speak in public, you know. Now imagine if we could coordinate better. If we could coordinate better, I'll probably take three themes that they could focus on. The first would be broadband availability because information is a new oil. If you can bring broadband more available to all the capital cities and all the major towns, whether it's Newe, Onisha, Enugu, Aba, Oweri, and just make a big fiber optic pipe that brings data and puts it freely, just give it away. Let everybody have access to the internet. Suddenly, information becomes cheaper. What that does for you is that education value, price of education goes down because we can spool the information. You know, it's easy, for instance, in American University of Nigeria in Yola, Atikos University, I'm on the board of that university. They have excellent internet connectivity and the university can get a lecturer from Los Angeles to give a lecture to the students because on video. So while you're trying to buy lecturers and pay them salary, you can pay them per hour based on what, they've, what they are teaching, you understand? And get the best expertise. Same thing happens in medicine. That's, that broadband information is critical. And then government can itself begin to move itself to a more efficient data-driven platform. They'll be able to extract more revenue from all of us, more taxation. Instead of this time where they're hiding their figures, they will not tell us how much they got from FAC, from Abuja. They don't want to tell us how much they make from IGI. If they're more efficient, they will make 10 times more money. Another area of intervention will be transportation. If you build the transport infrastructure, and these are things that are totally within the control of the governor. They don't have to go to Abuja for any approval. Build the road networks, build roads with gutters, please. It's even fact, it's better to put the gutter first before you build it, the road. Otherwise, the, the rain will wash it away. And build it to last. What you then begin to have is the opportunity of leveraging your agriculture. Because goods can come from the hinterland more efficient to the center and be moved out of the region. But importantly, another innate advantage we have that we have not exploited is tourism. If I could get more efficiently around the region, I could come into Enugu for a meeting, rush to Agulu Lake Hotel and have lunch, and maybe if they had something at Ebunike Cave, I'd go and check it out before I go to rest in Onisha. You see, so many things you can do if the road network works efficiently, but we have to do that road network and think about it, and think about it from a coordinated way, not the way the colonials, the, the Europeans did it for us, because some parts of our regions, it's almost like a box to go around them, because there's no road that traverses diagonally. And last but not the least is probably electricity. Now, and that one requires federal might, you know, because you need power to bring the efficiencies into the business. But I think that conversation will continue to get better. But if you could do broadband availability and you do road transportation infrastructure, you begin to enable other sectors very quickly. And I tell you, just the broadband alone and the road network would unlock your education opportunity, your healthcare opportunity, your tourism opportunity, and your agriculture. Those four can double the size of the economy in the region before you get to the power problems of electricity. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we'll open it up. A round of applause, please. Um, my question. When you talk about the values that um, Igbo people need to uphold in order to run enterprises effectively, I saw honesty, I saw um, you know, um, effectiveness, and I saw transparency. And whenever it is you interact with a lot of people, especially from other areas, there's always this line 
that Igbos are not to be trusted or that Igbos are always looking for a way to swindle people whenever they are in businesses with them. How do we counter that, um, the, 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 that, that paradigm? Yes, how do we move from that point where Igbos are always not to be trusted to the point where young people, Igbo people, can be trusted with whatever money or whatever thing you give them to hold on to? Secondly, the Imwaha system of recent became very, very popular because probably some white man came here and then took it to TED Talk and now we're all talking about it. How do we get Imwaha to become like more normalized? Aside from in the business sphere, we have it in the, um, in the industries, in, in, the, in the more structured and, and institutions. So that even when someone is not trying to do business and they're trying to do things like engineering, they're trying to do things like software development, we can have the same system replicated in all those places. Thank you. Ike uh, Chiloke, well, very good delivery. Uh, thank you for that uh, insight. I'd like to just make a very short comment. And my comment is that I like the idea that you're trying to let Igbos know, which is what most of us are trying to also instill in their minds, that Abuja is not as critical to them as their various states. What we are requesting for today, where people are clamoring for restructuring, if they can only understand that the system that exists now has given them the power and the opportunity to create a society that works for them, it will make a huge difference in the Southeast. Just adding to what you said as far as the size of the economy and looking at transportation alone, we're looking at the rail transport. You talked about road network. Rail transport is something that if these governors and the Southeast works together, they actually don't even need to make their own contribution as far as the funds because there are companies who are ready to do these things for them and get their money from what people pay. Rail, rail transport is supposed to be the exclusive list of the federal government. However, you can do rail transport within your own state, as within your own power, which means we can do rail transport from Onitsha all the way to Port Harcourt without the federal government. Everybody does his own within his own state, but it has to be as a coordinated effort. And these elections coming up, people are talking about apathy. You can see the number of people that actually came out to vote, and that is actually true. So even though the numbers that INEC registered, if you go through the communities and see the number of Igbos that came out, most of them stayed home. They have wishes of what they want, but they don't realize in a democracy is a matter of statistics. If you don't show up, you show out. That's how it works. So in the elections coming up in March 9th, you find that a lot of Igbos are not going to come out to vote because their priority is the center. Meanwhile, their priority is supposed to be the governors that govern them. There's no Igbo state that has ever been deprived of their federal allocation, which means you have money given to you every month to do as you please. But most Igbos don't know how much they get, how it's spent, and don't ask anybody any questions. And any time they agitate, they're agitating about the center without agitating about the local. So that's what I want to say thank you. And I hope that Tsinkatumi will continue to draw attention to these facts. Thank you. Um, my name is Ozo Onyebuchi. I, I run my own business. Um, when I was in the first year, uh, we had a course called Business Admin 101. Uh, I asked the, lec the lecturer was talking about entrepreneurship. I asked him, how do one start his business? He gave me, he just gave an answer. During our final year, we did a course called Public Policy Analysis. That's political science. Uh, I asked the professor, he was talking about starting when you manage a business, when you manage a business. I asked him again, how do you start your business? He said, maybe your father is a business owner. Maybe your mother is a business owner. I told him, my parents are of the civil service. They don't care about business, but I don't want to join the civil service. He said, maybe when you start. Now the question that, the problem that most young people have is how do they start? I am asking you, how do we start? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chibu Zongo, and I run, um, my name is Chibu Zongo. And I'm a founder of Express Water, so it works like Uber. 
uh, for tanker waters in Enugu, and also uh, a palm kernel oil mill. Uh, basically, um, like you said, there are some, certain things that we can control as individuals, and certain things that government has to, you know, act towards. So, for example, the EEDC charges industrial users 47 nairas, 95 kubo, in the southeast region. And every other region gets 30% uh, cheaper. 36 naira in Eko, Kaduna, and the rest. So, um, you know, sometimes they say that it's because of the high energy theft in Enugu. But I'm just wondering, uh, since it behoves on us to, to, it's a private sector driven business, why shouldn't we get power cheaper? Why are we getting power more expensive than everyone else in Nigeria? And meanwhile, we're very close to the gas, gas supply. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first question was on the narrative of Igbos seem to be uh, untrustworthy people and how difficult to get over that uh, perception. And I, I think that you, the way to do it is to continue to do the right thing. What happens is that those people that are saying it, actually, most of the people that are saying it have no linkage to your business. They just say it because that is what somebody else has repeated to them. But if you look at some of the biggest Igbo business people in, in the Southeast, and even in Lagos or Abuja, some of their biggest customers are the very same Yorubas that are saying that our ah, Igbos are not to be trusted. Why? The reason is they have done business with them for years and years, and over those number of years, they've come to learn and trust them. Someone like Koscharis, for instance, at the time he set up his BMW dealership, it turned out uh, that one of his bankers showed him how to do letters of credit. And he became proficient at being able to pay BMW well in advance of delivering these vehicles. And after three or four years of running it, BMW people were wondering, who is this Igbo man? Who, they don't know him as Igbo. Who is this Nigerian that always pays in advance? But he had built a relationship. They then came and said, look, we're going to set up shop and build your showroom properly. So it is similar to a proper BMW showroom anywhere in the world. And we'll send you the cars. And when you finish selling, send us back our money. You can see now what um, that diligent, continuous effort at building your reputation of integrity and hard work and honesty does. I'll give you my own personal example. I was Deputy Managing Director of Afrinvest in 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis. The capital of the business was 1.4 billion Naira. When the market had gone down, you know when the capital markets collapsed, we lost 6 billion Naira in one year. Now, by losing 6 billion Naira, it means that we finished, we lost some clients' monies, we also lost our capital so that our net worth was minus 4.6 billion naira. Now, I could have decided to resign, take another job as an ED in any of the banks that were offering me jobs. UBA was there, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. But I knew that if I left, my reputation as an, would be impugned forever in the financial services industry. I stayed back. My boss resigned and became the chairman. He is now the governor of Edo State, Godwin Obaseki. But I've worked hard over the years, for the last 10, 11 years, that we repaid back every single customer that we lost money for. So today, I will have the same Yoruba people you're talking about call me up and say, okay, Ike, I'll move two billion naira to you people. Like, please hold it. I'm going to London. When I come back, we can settle that transaction. You see? And that's Afrinvest. They know that the MD is an Igbo man. The deputy MD is another Igbo man, Victor Ndokoba. So you can change that concept because they, you've built your reputation. And you take it as a personal assignment and build your own personal brand. And if we all continue to build it, after a while, People will know, will start thinking of other things, and they will know that actually when you come to Ibo land and do business, you can be sure 
what they say is what you're going to get. Period. There was another question you said about how do you, you know, extend this, you know, uh, Waboy Oluaka system. I mean, we do get it today. It's called internship in most large companies. But there's also something I need to urge young people. That is the, the idea of having humility. I'll give you an example. Again, this is a personal example. Um, a friend of mine sent me the resume of two people. One was his daughter, another one his cousin or niece. And said, I, can you consider giving them a job in Afrin Best? I said, no problem. And he probably didn't think I would do anything about it. I sent it to the head of HR in my firm. The firm looked at both resumes and invited them both to come for interviews as interns. The, one of the ladies declined and said she doesn't want a job as intern, she wants a permanent job. And the other one said, yes, I'll come for the interview. Now, can you imagine, you have never done investment banking in your life. A major company says, come and be an intern. The humility of asking, sure, I want to come and be an intern. You never know what you're going to get. You know, maybe you ask and they say the starting salary is 50,000 naira a month because you're learning. After all, okay. She declined. My friend's daughter declined. I forwarded the response from my seat to, to, to my friend. Say, your daughter didn't come for interview, but the other girl came. The other girl came and did one year of internship. And as soon as she finished, she moved to 250000 a month. You see, now, that's the problem with some people saying, oh, I don't want to be more boy to anybody. I don't want to do internship. I just want to go straight to the top. It doesn't happen like that. You have to work hard and earn it. And that's one thing I really chastise our people for. Sometimes we're often too arrogant and dismissive. If they tell you, come, go there and find out. You'll be surprised that just in the interaction of the reception, you may even meet somebody that will hire you and do something else. Um, indeed, I haven't forgotten rail transportation. That's a very easy thing that if, if the governors of Indigo and Anambra State were organized, coordinated, you can build a rail line between here that passes through Oka to Onisha, and we'll be able to get there in 30 minutes and back. Because all they have to do is grant right of way. Right of way, governor's right is to give the land, is it not? He can sit and give right, he will sit down and plan with the guys on Anambra State. This is the straight line, no? the Chinese will come and design it. Governor will grant right of way to the border of Enugu, and the other governor will grant right of way to the border of Anambra. Bam, there's nothing else. The rail train will come and continue. Their permissions are there. And these are things that can be done with structuring and contracts. Even the so-called power we talk about. I mean, I'll let my uh, brother here talk about it because that is so much easier. But the last question I'll take is, how do you start your business? You know? And I'm, it's not a good question to ask a professor, you know, who has never done it before. <laughs> yeah? It's not a good question to ask a professor. What you, the person you should have asked is maybe the guy down the road that has a kiosk near your house or the one that's selling a chemist. You'd be surprised. You may be looking down at him and you should have gone to ask that person because that's the practical experience of how do you start a business. Um, I mean, the three examples I gave are young people that started from a passion they had and they started from an innate gift they had. But you see, sometimes a business comes from you having that passion and that energy and soon enough, Someone will say, hey, this boy is a bamboo. Let me find a way to support him. You know, if I know that one of my cousins likes to design clothes, you know, for me, at my level, I will make an outfit easily once a month or once every two months. Be between all the Ashwabi, I have to go for different weddings and funerals, yeah? There's an outfit to be made. About 10,000 naira. I say, okay, instead of using my regular tailor, oh yeah, bros, come on, sew it for me. And I, I went, and by the time he's done a good job, some people will sit and say, who, so they say, ah, this is expert tailor. I'll build him up. Before you know it, one or two people will come. You have to start from something, you know. But you also have to think creatively. Sometimes you're thinking that you need to open a shop. Your house could work. The place you live, when I was coming back from overseas, my wife is from the Netherlands. I was worrying, how do I come back? But she was the one that got a job in Nigeria that relocated us to Abuja from London. Instead of allowing her to live in the service flats at Shell Compound, 
like all the other expatriates. I said, no, no, bring that your rent money. We went and rented a big house in the same neighborhood. I then, because it's just me, her, and, I, and one child, I cut the ground floor into two, used half of it as Afrinvest office. That is how Afrinvest started in 2004. You see? You have to start from something. I didn't have money for rent, but my wife had it. So your house could be the place to start a business. You, you really need to want to do it. You know, it started from that house. The garage of the house, we made a reception. The guest bedroom next to the garage, you made it the main office. And then the, what they call the, you know, master's, the study was my office. From there, I hired one person, hired two people. Today, we are 80 professionals in Nigeria. You know, so you have to learn how to use what you have and push forward. And the last question was on power. EEDC charging 47 naira per kilowatt hour. Okay, let me, let me take that question. <laughs> um, there is no way EDC would charge higher than they are authorized to charge. So you have different categories, customer categories, that pay different amount of money. And if you go on the Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission's website, you'd see how much you're supposed to pay based on your customer category. So the idea that they charge them far less in some Yoruba states and charge us more here is an old wise tale. Um, it's not, they can't, and if, if indeed they are doing it, that's an opportunity for you to make a lot of money. Because all you have to do is provide evidence, you know, to NERC that that is happening and that they'll pay very dearly for it. Um, if you permit me to respond to some of the questions you got, um, there are a lot of narratives around Igbo people. And they are just narratives. Yeah? And I'm not sure we should dwell too much on them. Some of these narratives also follow the Jews. So most people will say, oh, the Jews are. In fact, uh, what's his name? Shakespeare wrote his, uh, uh, you know, the Shylock and made Shylock a Jew. Because that's what people would typically do about traders they buy stuff from. Yeah? But. There is no way you can survive in business without integrity. Absolutely no way. If you dupe people today, the story will go around and they will stop coming. So if Igbos have been successful in business, there is no way they would have been dupes. So forget that narrative. Focus on what you're doing. And um, that's the way to go. On how to start a business, there's no way to learn how to swim but to jump inside a pool. You can, you can read about it in a book. You can sit by the Enugu Sports Club swimming pool by the side and be reading the book. But at some point, you have to jump in. And in my own little experience with entrepreneurship, you must have a passion for something. There must be an overriding passion for something you want to do, an itch you want to scratch, a need you need to feel, something that you must do. Chasing money is good, but creating value is better. So figure out that thing that you feel that you must do, start doing it, and before you know it, you'll be employing people. Just so one last um, uh, example. There's a young man who I met back in 2012. Um, he had helped me rent a house in Abuja. And he wanted me to help him get a job in the federal government. Maybe because he knew I did some work in the federal government. And I said to him, why do you want to waste your life? Why do you want to go work for government in some ministry and live a very lackluster life? What is it that you're passionate about? He said, well, he's really passionate about facility management. He wants to, you know, take buildings and, you know, clean them and fix them. I said, okay, let's step down from facility management. Let's start with cleaner. Yeah? So you're going to start a cleaning company, go spend the weekend, write it down, and let's talk. Well, long story short, today he employs about 50 people in Abuja. He cleans about, he has about six major clients. Most of, some of them are banks and shopping centers and schools. Simply because he had a passion and he was willing to go through with it. There have been times when he got to end of month, he couldn't pay salary, but he stayed on with it. And today, 
I spoke to him a few days ago and he said, oh, that he's moved into his own house somewhere in Guarimpa. Oga, he said to me, Oga, it's different to live in your own compound or when you're not sharing with people, you know? And that's the story of, you know, six, seven years of just diligent jumping into the pool and figuring out how to swim. So we, we take it back to the audience. Yeah. I have many questions, but I'll try to narrow it down. I've been of the opinion that business is, um, you have to have it inside of you to be able to do business and be very successful at it. I would like to have your opinion there, whether business people are made or they are born. Then secondly, is it okay to have support systems for businesses, especially here in the South East? What do I mean? It seems as if there's some sort of disconnect between our older generation of very successful businessmen and the younger generation. And of course, business has evolved. The way of doing business now um, is very vast and involves different models. But a friend of mine and myself together were involved in a project we called Accelerate Labs. It took um, a Yoruba lady who runs the Future Project Nigeria to partner with Microsoft to run a free training program for young people here in the southeast. One happened in Oka, two happened here in Enugu. And in that process, we discovered um, someone we call Ubabio Biomass um, Energy Solutions. His name is Ikenna Ubab. He took that program to help him launch out. But he knew what he wanted to do. He had ideas. He was afraid somehow. And he had no understanding of business structure and um, trainings. But he did that training for three months and he got equipped. And today, he's able to come out with a product that can help solve respiratory health challenges in the form of uh, an improved efficient stove. So my question is, is it okay to have support systems here? How should it go? What form should it take? Um, have systems where people can go through a business school Maybe they qualify on scholarship and go through that training. I've witnessed a few of those trainings here in South East, and it has made a lot of impact and difference in people. But one thing I also noticed that sometimes you reach out for support. Amongst our older generation of businessmen here, they don't seem to understand what we're talking about or see it as a need. Thank you. Um, how do I put it? Okay, there is there are a group we belong to a group of um, a network of professionals called CESOP. Within that group, which is the Southeast Professionals uh, Network, what we are trying to do, one of the projects that we have is to generate a 500 million Naira investment fund that will be available for startups, that is businesses, young businesses that are coming up here. But we found that um, in preliminary discussions that there seems to be a lot of resistance by Igbo business men, wealthy people, to actually contribute money into an investment fund and make it available for um, startups in this, in this region. So my question to you is how do we go about getting Igbo business men to work collaboratively work together around creating access to funds so that when these young people come with their business ideas and they need seed capital to start those businesses, they can actually apply to this type of an investment fund, which exists in everywhere else, but just like with education, where every rich person, most wealthy people from the Southwest own schools they own primary schools, secondary schools, universities. But I don't know how many rich Igbo men have ever set up a school, an education venture in this environment. There seems to be two things, that, something that we need to get over around this question of working together. I don't know if you have an answer from your perspective as an investment manager, investment fund manager. I'm Chibwaz Ejibu, the professor of plastic surgery. Uh, it's a okay. I think. Okay, this louder. She was a GB room, a professor of plastic surgery. What you said, the presentation was quite lucid, and I want to thank you and join in congratulating you. 
as part of the example you gave, even though it, you use so much of the data on finance, but it is real. Because if we use the numbers we have of people coming out of school in most of the Saudi states, and take Enugu, for instance, from ESUT, UNN, IMT, Hamufu, and like, you have not less than 10 to 15,000 persons graduating in a year. And out of this, government does not engage up to 10% in any year. So they buy up, they, they tie up, and it is real. It is a challenge for all of us, and I'm glad you are offering some uh, assistance to the young people. But I think we can go further. Your establishment, uh, like a number of others at that level, doesn't exist anywhere in the southeast. I know it exists in Lagos, in Port Harcourt, and in Abuja. And part of things being practical enough is that so many of our young persons would love to even come to you, would love to be able to interact with you. What does it take for such an establishment like yours, where you are the boss, to have a presence in the Southeast? When can we expect that to materialize? Thank you. Good evening, sir. My name is Andrew Okoye. I work in Brunswick Red Limited. Sir, I would like to ask if you are willing to create a support system, just like she asked. You've done a great job. What you've done is almost an economic blueprint. But um, from the level you're operating, the younger ones might not be able to interpret that and execute. Uh, I'm waiting to get his attention. So my question is, are you willing to set up a support system? And if, if yes, there is also other support systems that are ready to also support that system that have already done works for both the state, uh, federal government, and multinationals who also have data that these people can exploit. Both the, those coming from tertiary uh, institutions and those that are coming from the informal sector. And it has to be digital so that it saves everybody's time and people send in things, you see if it get back to them, bring back whatever you have, and move from there. Thank you. Can you explain what you mean by support system? Support system is um, where you have a portal and get the best 50 ideas for, for the month. And he's in his office, I'm in my office, and we look at a different industry segmented and say, okay, this is how you go, like mentorship. This is what you need to do, this is the template. You see what they do, they bring it back to you, and you tell them what to do again. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here first time, and uh, I think I appreciate what's going on here. I belong to, Enugu, to ESIMA, Enugu Chamber of Commerce. Well, uh, I think my brother has touched one of the issues of mentorship, which I think is necessary if we really want to grow the younger ones. But I would like to grow the issue of uh, the value the orientation in our society, because this is the only way we can uh, summon some of the challenges of building partnership. Because there's something happening, many of us who must have experienced it, if you're trying to uh, partner with someone in our society, because we have this issue of somebody want to be a king, and the rest will not grow up, even though it's implied, but it's happening. So we need to uh, reorient our value system so that we can now uh, be part of the new economic order, whereby you cannot grow alone, you have to partner with someone else. So another issue is about the strengthening institution in Igbo land. Because you downplayed a lot what the government has to do, or our government, Southeast government, must do to be part of this, uh, our economic uh, blueprint. Because I believe if our government will come together and contribute by promoting 
some of those areas, we have the comparative advantage. That will help to boost uh, the Southeast economy. For instance, I, I did a study on the diaspora remittance. And I know, officially, the amount coming to Nigeria is the neighborhood of 20 billion per annum. And majority of this fund, if you check it, you know, is most of our brothers and sisters sending this money. So we need to find a way how this money can be utilized to empower the Southeast economy. Thank you very much. Um, it will be from the transportation bias because um, I happen to be involved in transportation. The, uh, and when Anamco finished here, I took up the dealership for Marco Polo in Nigeria. If you notice what's going on in Lagos today about public transportation, we advised the governments in the Southeast the same thing we told those in Lagos. Those in Lagos are doing exactly that. They're building new bus stations, they're remodeling their roads, and they're getting public transportation in place. What I've noticed here is that we must realize that there's a relationship between politics and economy. We must start to decide about who will rule us. If you don't have whatever system of selection we need, it has to be one that will target doing things for us. At last uh, two years ago, I tried to establish the IOD in Enugu here. I was head of branch development in Lagos. We couldn't get people, 40 people, to establish the branch here. There's no branch in the southeast. There are three branches in Ogun State. You know, it makes me feel bad. I think that we have to start a system that, don't say politics is very important, very important, but we don't have to compete at the center, but we must develop a system where those who are here will do what we want them to do collectively, or they leave. Thank you. I think the first question in the second batch of questions was, uh, business people sort of born or made? Are people... Are there people that are natural business people? Um, and what kind of training programs or support systems can you find? You know, some people have the advantage, obviously, of having maybe a more um, outgoing personality, you know, rather than someone that's shy and reclusive, or being exposed to a brother, an uncle, or family that has business already. But I do think that, you know, part of the challenges we see today with young people who want to do business ideas is that they're actually uh, not as hardworking as our parents of old. You know, in an age, in the age I grew up and graduated from Ife, I don't want to share how old I am, but that was 1987 that I graduated. We didn't have internet. And the only computer I saw before I graduated was the, the com this uh, printout from a mainframe computer, one IBM thing. I had to write my program by Fortran 4, and then it's, and I had this card I could stuck into it, and it ran out, and they printed my program. I did civil engineering at the time. But even without ever seeing a computer, I could research and figure out what the latest standards were of IBM, what was going on around the world. Today, a smartphone like this has more computing power than the entire computer center of University of Ife back in 1987. But I see many young men and women who have a smartphone. They come to me for a business to help them set up a business. And I ask them, what research have you done? They show me their business plan. I say, what kind of rubbish is this? If you go to Google and type how to write a business plan. It will give you a thousand examples. You have not done that, but you know too how to go and check out uh, Flavor and watch him on YouTube or Linda Ikeji. So I'm saying that people are actually not resilient. They are not hardworking enough. If they were to work as hard as our parents did with limited resources, they'd be able to produce a first-rate business plan just from using the same tool, Google, to search, rather than using it to search for other things. And I think that it's when you have demonstrated a high level of proficiency in that idea that it becomes easy for people to support and help you. And so in my job where I see lots of business plans from other young people, I have to say that the quality and standards coming from the boys in Western Nigeria are often of superior level to that come from Southeastern. And it could be that they are closer to Lagos. But the same information is also available to you if you have internet access. And I think that we just need to do more work in that respect. Um, 
The second question was around uh, network of professionals. You're trying to set up this investment club and how difficult it is getting Igbo businesses to invest in it. Um, yes, there's a lot of issues about uh, our capacity as a people to work together, you know. It's legend. But it's also, also issues of, about how businesses transition. And I think that there's also a linkage in the two questions. If you could use data to aggregate all the boys doing internships in the market, and you know that each of them is going to spend between three to five years before a do owner below their shop, and you know that some of their masters are some of the best in the trade, you already know as an investor that rather than asking these people, their masters to pay 500,000 Naira each or 1, 000, 1 million Naira each, assuming there are 1,000 of them coming out this year, if I'm going to pay 1 million Naira each, you do hand you no, no, it will be 1 billion Naira. But if you know statistically that these boys are being trained under experienced traders, yeah, you have that data. And you know that statistically, when they start, 1,000 new businesses start in the Southeast as a result of this training of three to five years. In the first uh, three years, uh, uh, probably 30 to 40 percent of them will die. By the fifth year, only probably 20 percent of them will be surviving. But the 20 percent surviving by the fifth year will have cumulative capital that is about 1,000 times the entire 1 billion that was invested. And that is the statistics from the commercial system that we've developed. If you knew that, then you know that you can actually come in as a venture capitalist and tell the audio guy, please don't bother giving the 1 million naira each. I'll do it for you. And I want to take a stake in the profit of those that survive. This is how the typical venture capital model works. But the, the ingredient in all of that is that you knew that those boys had proper training and they actually served their time. The challenge I think a lot of evil uh, billionaires have when it comes to these investment clubs is often they say, okay, if you bring this money and just give it, how do I know that the person actually has the experience and capacity to work? And in my, in my own little experience with Afroinvest, I've been managing director for, this will be my 10th year. If 10 people apply to Afroinvest, it's likely that only 20 or 30 percent are from the southeast. Very few actually apply. If I hire one out of the 20 percent and hire two from the, from the southwest, yeah, I can tell you that in two years, the guy from the southeast wants to leave to set, do something else. He doesn't actually stay long enough to have the experience. You know? Meanwhile, the Yoruba boy will stay there for five years, seven years. And the reason why, for me, Five years is minimum for you to be an experienced investment banker is that I need you to see a market cycle completely. Market cycle, the markets go in boom and bust. So if you've just come after a recession, you see the market only going up, and you spend two years and you leave, you forget that the market can go down. But if you spend five years, you see the market go up, and suddenly the same market will go down, crash. And I think by the time you want to set up this investment club, it's not so much as bring the money. It is more of these are the profile of the kind of investments we want to put the money to work in. That will, that will resonate more than, oh, let's just raise the money. Yeah? And if you, if you can demonstrate that those people actually have had that track record and the experience, it's not just the idea. Because at the time I'm parting with cash, then you'll probably find some more traction. Um, and that could be a way to get more Igbo businesses to support it. Um, there's a question. Okay. Afro Invest in Enugu. Um, no, there was another question about how do we get Igbo businesses to provide. Um, okay, no, that's the one I answered. Okay. There's a comment a gentleman made about the number of university graduates coming out, about 10 to 15,000 between ESUT, UNN, IMT, Ehamufu. And clearly, it is not possible or practical for the government to employ all of them, even on an annual basis. If government to set a target of saying, I'll take 10%, 10% of 
That's 1,000 to 1,500 people. It will still find a challenge to, pro to provide adequate career support for them. But there's a company that's called Andela. And they, let me just explain the opportunity of data. Andela is a company that started out in San Francisco, realizing that we are living in a world of information and data explosion, and particularly the programming that supports it. So you put, pick up your phone, you, you make a call, you see this app on WhatsApp, you download it. You know, each time you download an app or a program, you're pulling down on a software that somebody has to build. Today, the biggest scarcity this technology world is facing is human beings who actually program, write these programs for you. So Andela came to Nigeria, looked for a location to set up shop, and they were looking for locations that had broadband access. Governor Fashola, seeing what these guys are doing, understanding through the former Minister of Communication, um, Mobola Johnson, Johnson, piped all the, all the data band we could get in that Yaba area, where Yaba Tech is, University of Lagos. And soon they all started setting up. And what they do is they take our young men and women who are around that area, train them, and they're sitting in Lagos, writing programs and software for companies around the world. Because when you write a software, it's the same thing. It could be a little software program to make the door of an aeroplane open when you press it. It could be a software to operate a lift. You don't know who, but they ask you, they train you, you have your certifications, and you find young, young people who are working for them earning $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a month because they've been trained. And they are sitting in Lagos simply because they have broadband access. And if you think of our governors explaining to them the opportunity of broadband, it's more effective. When I did Oganiru, the investment summit, and I brought Leo Stan Eke of Xenox Computer, I was trying to, we were trying to convince our governor about this, but unfortunately, he didn't quite get it. But we're hoping that we'll get the message across. But it's that sort of thing that allows you to begin to bring up businesses here. Because you need, businesses look for areas of competitive advantage. If I put broadband access in Enugu, and make it commonly available. It is cheaper for businesses to be here. I can do a call center for MTN, employ everybody here in this room, and you'll be answering phone calls forever. I'd be paid because MTN has a hundred, how many, 60 million customers. Assuming that one person have a problem at any point in time, you, you're not even enough to answer all the problems coming through. And you're all being paid for it. And this is what we need to do to move into the information age. Um, when will Afrinvest come to the Southeast? Yes, I admit I'm guilty as charged. We have a project at the moment. We're actually uh, in the capital raising mode to convert ourselves into a commercial bank, a regional commercial bank with headquarters in Enugu. So that is our current plan. Mm. And, and this, the, the plan of this bank is to take a regional banking license all this data I'm giving you is actually coming from the same project we have been doing on how, how can a, a small commercial bank survive in a, in a world where there are GT Bank and First Bank and Zenith. And when we then began to sift through the commercial opportunity and then realized the worst thing we can do is to actually go to Lagos. You know, it would be like uh, a, a small rabbit trying to go and play with lions. lions. You'll be eating alive. But if we were to come to the southeast, and Enugu is a natural capital because it gives us a good location to everywhere, it, it allows us to quickly begin to deploy high standard banking services, the likes that you don't get. Actually, the, the banks here, by the time you get a bank branch here, they're really only using this place as deposit mobilization. They are not giving you any expert advice on anything. We want to center our expertise here. Meanwhile, Afrinvest will be centered still in Lagos so that there's that commonality, you know, because the bank will have a different name and a different license. So that is what we intend to do. And I do hope that within the next 12 months, I actually intend to set up an Afrinvest branch in itself in, 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 in uh, Enugu or somewhere in the Southeast. Um, there was a, there a couple more questions here. Yeah? Uh, willing to create support systems, yeah? I think the answer is yes. I'm willing to do so. Um, and um, I do think that it's not, everything can't be virtual. 
everything can be website driven. Any support system must have a way for us to interrogate the person that had the idea. Um, I'm the national secretary for the Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford University, and every year we select one scholar that goes to Oxford. The system allows many students to apply online. I should make that open. If you're less than 26 years old by 1st October, if you'll be less than 26 years old by 1st October 2020, you are eligible to apply for an all expenses paid scholarship to Oxford, so long as you have a first class degree in any subject you studied, so long as what you want to study in is available in the University of Oxford. Currently, I have one scholarship a year. Some years, I get two scholarships a year. And all my job is to sift through the application process. But the, that model, like you're talking about, is a portal. People load their dossier online. But even after loading it, we need to interrogate it. And by the time we shortlist, we must bring them physically and interview and speak to them. And often, sometimes, what is written down is far from what the person has capacity to do the minute you speak to them for five minutes. You know, because some people are are excellent at going online and you know getting documents and packaging it and they look good while others may not be as good but the minute you speak to them you realize wow this is a diamond in the rough so yes i'm willing to support that effort and um, do it uh, i think there was one last question from dr value orientation it's uh, it is really it is one of those things actually i think it's even more difficult in a way than the issue about Ndibo, are they not trustworthy? For me, it is the fact that we don't do enough partnerships, you know, and often we don't, worse, we don't institutionalize. And not doing partnerships doesn't allow many of our businesses to transcend generations, you know, because we are now in 2019, and if you think about the top 10 businesses that exist today, think about 20 years ago, none of them were probably there because they had a different crop of businesses back then. But if you go to Lagos and think about the top 10 businesses there, 20 years ago, you probably see easily three or four of them were there 20 years ago. And many of them have become large institutions, you know, about Tudeco or Honeywell. He's just a shareholder in First Bank that I know him from a business relationship. But the scale of his businesses, he easily has 5,000 employees, you know, and recruits easily 500 people. And I think that um, being able to do that cultural reorient reorientation amongst our existing billionaires today is critical. To, and that starts from their capacity to admit people into their existing businesses to help that business transcend. And then they'll begin to see opportunities of mergers or acquisitions or alliances, joint ventures with other businesses, which, will, which then becomes natural. Rather, rather than thinking that this cake I'm going to have it. They actually think of expanding the size of the cake or more for everyone. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Please, a round of applause for IQOK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, indeed, I'm indeed happy that we, we insisted and tracked him down and refused to take any of the excuses we were given. And I'm indeed grateful that he accepted to uh, be the speaker for this month. And he has triggered a lot of thoughts um, in all of us. And we hope that even as we leave tonight, we continue these conversations in the different um, groups we belong to. And on that note, I'd like to invite one of our biggest supporters, uh, Chief Chike Madeke, Chairman Urban Radio, to give the vote of thanks as we bring this to a close on or before 8 o'clock. Well, thank you, Patrick. The first of the first Friday Makanona, any more opportunity to be here to see our people and interact with our people. Uh, firstly, an American ND Center for Memories for being consistent at keeping this uh, uh, appointment. And then I also uh, thank uh, this post club 
for providing the facility. And in Kekanke, uh, the chairman, Chief Ben Itiaba. Uh, today is a special day because um, we are known for enterprise, and we brought here Mr. Enterprise. Um, choke, choke, and playing in the high waters of Lagos. Uh, it's interesting he told his story very briefly and how he survived even um, in the midst of uh, the turbulence of uh, the finance world in Lagos at the time. But that goes again to show the resilience of uh, the buying. Um, what he said also about our people not having the patience to stay for a long time in business is very true. Uh, I do not blame them sometimes. It's because of the support system is not there. Onyegosia uh, Kukwo na university. Obu Nandibava to ego where welkwari uwa ukwo. It's expected by the next year or two years after no ge bido whatever ego no no. But it's not very so funding Kayoba because probably they come from uh, maybe better to do families and then Onya uh, Gusia, his only responsibility is to take care of himself or herself. So, on a Mendibani, Adam no Kebe, Ebanam Walu for a long time. Because found where responsibility. We will, I think some other time it will be it will be researched into, you know, come on how to do about it. And then uh, enterprise is something edumalindibo. Uh, or if I did not DNNDibo. But if you look at how the country is set up, the field that does the level. And any enterprise now like it, on our design, the enterprise core design in very known parameter. Open a field guard flat, or the flat. Open a goal post guard uh, inside or outside. I'm a goal post today. But in recent times, goal posts may change. Sometimes, in my physical goal post, it's very difficult for our young people. Then the banks. Before, when you do business, okay, okay, if you have good turnover, the banks will give you money. Kita, you will go 100 million to a bank, see bank, you go, bank will not give you money. So it's really tough for us, and it's, really, it's tougher for the newer generation. But he has given you a tip. And that tip, Onyeg, is the instrument you have in your hand, your smartphone. When we started business, if you asked us to design an aeroplane, we would say, yes, we can. We get the order, then we go into the library. It will take us maybe a month to research on how to design an aeroplane. But now, if, you, if I ask you to design an aeroplane as a young person, if what you just do is, okay, do case uh, design an aeroplane. You have a thousand and one answers. So you could see that Business is going to be easier for you. A business is actually easier now to start. And it's based on also the parameters within this generation. They need their office. This generation can work from their home. Open your screen as a cell photo, and it will let you, it will, it will make you think that he's in a very uh, a big office. So there are challenges, all right. Yeah, there are challenges, all right. Man, if you marry more challenges. So I like to encourage our young people to uh, put their finger into what we have uh, learned today from the expert. And uh, on this note, I say thank you very much for finding the time. And Patrick and your team, we thank you also very much for always finding Ndibo Vibo. I thank you very much, Joker. Okay. And on that note, we bring it to a close. Thank you so much for coming. And we'll be here again first Friday of April.
and we'll announce very soon who the speaker will be. Thank you very much.